I'm Sean Faircloth, Director of Strategy and Policy with the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science U.S. And I'm honored to be here with Catherine Stewart, the author of The Good News Club. And we're going to chat a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court decision uh, that really uh, was the premise, uh, if you will, for a lot of these activities that she writes about in her book and what the aftermath uh, of that decision has been. Uh, I, I just want to begin, Catherine, by uh, talking about, you know, when I was in law school, there were uh, a lot of these Republican-appointed justices that I admired. Uh, Justice Stevens was appointed by uh, Gerald Ford, and David Souter was appointed by the first President Bush. Uh, they were viewed as moderate or conservative justices. They wrote strong dissenting opinions, these Republican-appointed justices, about the decision, the Good News Club decision in 2001. And they really spoke from a viewpoint that I think its, its basis comes from decades before, like in the McCollum decision in 1948, that really was the standard of separation of church and state before that. And maybe, Catherine, you'd want to describe that and remind me of law school. In the 1948 decision, Justice Frankfurter explained that any activity that, quote, sharpens the consciousness of religious differences among public school children um, causes precisely the consequences against which the Constitution was directed when it prohibited the government common to all from becoming embroiled, however innocently, in the destructive religious conflicts of which the history of even this country records some dark pages. See, what happens when a religious group inserts itself um, in the public schools and tries to sort of use the public school for the promotion of its own agenda, um, it does sharpen the consciousness of reli religious differences among school children. Um, it's um, completely predictable. What happens is that um, all of a sudden, you know, kids go to school together, they just look at their friends as their friends, and all of a sudden there's a group after school saying, well, you know, you've got to figure out who's not like you, who is not the right kind of Christian, or who's not a Christian, and then and, and, and bring those kids, tell those kids the news that they don't, if they don't believe in Jesus, they're, they're going to be separated from God forever. Those kids are going to um, start looking at their friends as, you know, as, as different. As, as the other, Exactly, if you will. as yeah. the other. And from an attorney's perspective, I think it's ironic because a lot of times I'll hear decisions like McCullough uh, framed as, well, those radical leftists. Well, Justice Frankfurter was viewed as a conservative justice. The justices who dissented in the 2001 Good News case, again, Stevens, who to this day, he's alive, considers himself a moderate or conservative, was a Republican appointee. Souter, a Republican appointee. So in fact, I just think it's important to understand the context that when we get to the good news decision, it is actually the radical decision moving away from separation of church and state. And maybe if you could take a moment to briefly describe uh, that decision. Well, in the 2001 Supreme Court uh, decision, Good News Club versus Milford Central School, um, the court basically pushed free speech so far that the Establishment Clause, which prohibits government endorsing or funding of an establishment of religion, has been eviscerated. Um, they, uh, the, the court argued that religion is nothing more than speech from a certain point of view, and therefore to exclude these religious activities from the schools is to discriminate against their religious viewpoint. Now, is religion nothing more than speech? Um, I don't think so, and I don't think our... Um, constant, uh, founders of our Constitution thought so either. We have two separate clauses, two separate and distinct clauses in our First Amendment, the, um, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, which treat religion as something separate and distinct from just speech. And it's because of those clauses that um, religion has certain um, benefits in our society in terms of uh, t taxes and also in terms of, um, you know, religions, religious groups don't have to abide by the same non-discrimination laws that other groups do, either for-profit or, or non-profit. Um, and uh, this is also a reason why it's best to keep a religion free from government institutions. I think the reason we have such a diverse and vibrant uh, uh, a religious life here in America is precisely because of the Establishment Clause, which has prohibited um, government uh, endorsing of, of, a, of an establishment of religion. Um, but it was convenient for the uh, legal advocacy groups of the religious right in this instance to argue that speech is not, uh, religion is nothing more than speech from a certain viewpoint, and it's had dire consequences on our public schools. And I guess what I would uh, add to that is when you examine the decision and read uh, the majority opinion, 
uh, they imply that, oh, this is rather innocuous, this is not going to have much in terms of major consequences, and further uh, state that, well, really these good news clubs are very clearly separate uh, from school activity. And I want to kind of explore what's really happened since the decision came down uh, in 2001. First, uh, they talk about specifically in the decision that, well, they make a big deal of the fact that, well, the children were taken from, in that case, an elementary school classroom and moved to, I guess, a middle school or other uh, classroom, and therefore it was clearly a division between the secular school and the religious activity, but what's happened since in terms of the use of elementary school classrooms? Well, there are many good news clubs that are, take place in elementary school classrooms. It's interesting, the Milford decision, uh, I think it was the case was argued, it was at K through 12 school. Um, good news clubs are in public elementary schools. In our school in Santa Barbara and Seattle, schools across the country, we're talking kindergarten through fifth grade or possibly sixth grade. Um, they're not taking place on middle school and high school campuses. Um, there are other religious initiatives that take place in those uh, at that level, but Good News Clubs target on those public elementary school uh, schools. And often, not only do you have Good News Clubs taught in classrooms, but you have teachers who, you know, are regular school teachers. In, in Santa Barbara, there's, I think, a, a gym teacher right now who's teaching a Good News Club. Um, and uh, in Pasadena, for instance, there's a fourth grade teacher who's teaching a Good News Club. So at, you know, at 2 o'clock, the teacher is teaching, you know, 5 times 5 equals 25. And at 2.20, she's teaching, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And so, th this is an actual uh, uh, salaried teacher on yes. campus in the classroom. So from the child's perspective, uh, an it's authority figure it's absolutely. on campus. And children want to um, please their teachers. They want to please uh, figures of authority in their public schools. So it, um, it, it further confuses the issue and it further drives home the sort of blending in the children's minds between you know what's taking place in the school and what is uh, endorsed and sponsored and by again, the school. And again, both from the child's perspective and from the adult's perspective, the parental perspective, the blending of uh, authority figures on campus, then becoming an authority figure within minutes after that, uh, is is clearly an intermingling and, and one that was not really implied uh, in the 2001 decision. Which leads me to another question about sort of school hours, because they describe sort of a very bright line between what's happening during the school day and afterwards. But I understand there's some you know graying of that, and I want to know. Well, a works. lot of times the um, Good News Club teachers will show up before the bell rings with balloons, with trays of candy and cupcakes, or maybe at the end of school they're setting up the, a table in the auditorium. I've seen this, you know, laden with candy and cookies and things like that. And um, uh, sometimes kids are able to see them come on campus. A parent in Valencia, California told me about how the Good News Club leader would show up at her uh, kid's uh, kindergarten um, her public elementary school before the bell rang and actually she would come into the kindergarten classroom and do a roll call um, at the end of classroom to figure out who to take. Uh, thus effectively separating the children, segregating the children uh, by religion. And I was just thinking even with the name, there's the good news kids over here and then the not so good news kids. Well what happens <laughs> is uh, it, this, this does sharpen the consciousness of uh, religious differences among kids and it also does confuse and further confuse in children's minds the authority of the public school with the authority of the good news club instructors. Now as part of uh, their program, their official uh, program, they uh, and uh, orchestrated from above in a national organization, they talk about how if you don't learn the good news, there are consequences, and even encourage, as I understand it, children to let other children know Absolutely. about even hellfire-like consequences. Do you have examples of that? Uh, where well, they are always uh, t they do talk about hell in their program, and they also use um, uh, they say also in addition to talking about hell, they say separated from God forever. That seems to be a language that I hear sort of repeated over and over again. Um, they talk about sin and there was children deserving punishment for their sins um, and things like that. But if you look at their statement of faith, it's actually very specific. It's 15 point statement of faith and they talk about the lake of fire and that old devil servant. Say, I can't get a fine language. It's really interesting. Lake of fire. They talk about the lake of fire. They will, quote, remain after death in misery until the final judgment of the great white throne. This is from the CF statement of faith. After that, they'll be, quote, cast into the lake of fire, which is the, quote, the, quote second death to be punished with everlasting destruction. Um, wow. The coda is a belief in the reality and personality of Satan, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the world. 
Um, interestingly, there are some other points that are less frequently spelled out in, in uh, statements of faith, and I think it's really important for parents to understand this when they uh, think about signing their kids up to the Good News Club or if they're, you know, thinking about passing a sort of an opinion on what the Good News Clubs are all about. You know, many people say, it's Bible study, they'll just teach kids to be kind to their neighbors and be nice people. What could be wrong with that? Well, according to the CEF's own statement of faith, quote, there is no degree of reformation, however great, no attainment in morality, how high, no culture, however attractive, no humanitarian and philanthropic schemes and societies, however useful, no baptism or other ordinance, however administered, that can help the sinner to take even one step toward heaven. You know, only belief in Jesus is going to get you to heaven. So good works. Good works don't mean anything. Right. So in other words, loving your neighbor or being a kind, ethical human being are really right. not the thing that they're teaching here. All they're teaching is belief and obedience. And so despite the innocuous uh, framing of this that we heard from the Supreme Court in 2001, you have classrooms being used, you have authority figures who blend from the school day to after school. And interestingly, uh, Thomas did say something in that decision about they're just teaching uh, morality and ethics, um, but actually what they're teaching is, quote, you know, no attainment in morality, however high. So that is contradicted by the very statement of faith of the Child Evangelism Fellowship. Right, and, and a, a type of immorality, one might, might argue. And then furthermore, they uh, have been able to distribute flyers on campus and groups have been welcomed on campus. And I understand it as it's turned out in real life, that has occurred in a discriminatory fashion. That is to say, the Good News Clubs have done well in this rubric, but maybe not so much minority viewpoints. That's true. When minority religions and uh, other groups try to exercise their, uh, the rights of the majority faiths, they're really shut down. Um, by uh, convention, if not by law, they're excluded. I mean, um, uh, it's interesting. When the Good News Club came to our public elementary school in Santa Barbara, a friend of mine who's a Mormon said, can you imagine if we did this? It would be all over the national news. And I think she's right. There are many, many religious minorities, if they started to try to do this uh, in the way that the majority of uh, that the Good News Clubs or do. Or if non-religious people. Yes. Right. And uh, interestingly, when uh, we moved to Santa, uh, from Santa Barbara to New York City, and I write about this in the book, um, I discovered Look, there are many different groups that uh, try to proselytize to children under the guise of character education. And when we moved to New York City, I discovered a group that was te supposedly teaching character education um, to my kid. It was sponsored by the Kabbalah Center. And as soon as it, enough awareness was raised that this was actually a Kabbalah Center program, um, parents demanded um, that the group w be withdrawn from the school, and they were, without any fuss or fanfare. But it's very, you know, when it's a, one of the Christian groups that are doing it, like Team Impact, Commandos USA, you know, these kinds of groups that come in to the public schools with, you know, lessons on, you know, drunk driving and character and other useful topics, um, uh, and, and really are, are in there trying to, you know, uh, leave with a, some uh, collection of young religious converts, it's really difficult uh, to and get them withdrawn because as long as the language of their program is stripped of any references to God or Jesus, um, it's, it's deemed to be legal. But and as so, you can yeah. see, a, a minority group, a faith group trying to come in and do the same thing is kind of, a, is, is easy to exclude. Which majority tyranny is exactly what Madison warned us against and what appears to be the case in this instance. And for me, it's really an issue of parental notice and parental control. Uh, what I mean by that is that the Supreme Court talks as if, well, this is very innocuous, but really it seems like parents are not getting adequate notice of the nature of these groups or control over what their kids might be guided into, really unbeknownst to the parents, much less to the children. Yeah, that's true. I mean, many parents, I've heard from many parents who signed their kids up to go to the uh, good news clubs, and they thought this was going to be fine, and the kids would come home and, and say, Mommy, Daddy, um, we don't go to the right kind of church. And uh, so the parents uh, didn't realize it, but their children were being converted to a form of faith that was at odds with the faith of their own parents. Right. And, and for me, obviously, I agree, as I began, with Justice Souter and Justice Stevens, Republican appointees to the Supreme Court on this uh, issue. Unfortunately, they lost that battle, and we're in the world we're in, the post-Good News uh, Club world. But even under this decision, it seems there are interesting avenues to discuss about notification of parents, 
about information about who's an authority figure in the classroom, where really I would even argue that the spirit of the 2001 decision, however flawed, is being violated. And that really, I think, raises uh, what is, has been sort of, there's a pointy wedge uh, that these groups were able to use the Supreme Court decision uh, as a tool for. And now they've been able to expand where they've created, as you've described in your book, this huge multi-million dollar effort in American public schools that really was not anticipated, certainly by the framing of the decision in 2001. And that's true. I mean, they really spread very quickly. When I started this project, there were four good news clubs in public ele elementary schools in Santa Barbara, and today there are 11. Yeah, and one thing that I would add about this, and I really am impressed with what you bring up in, in your book, because I think it, it needs the light of day. That, to, th to me, is the most important aspect right now, is bringing the light of day to these issues. And I certainly think that people should be encouraged throughout the United States to just at least gather information and find out what's happening in your community with regard to Good News Clubs and certainly the Richard Dawkins Foundation. We're interested in helping to gather together that information. But the religious right, if I were to turn this around and see where it might be to our advantage, is that children matter and they matter because it's the right thing to care for children, but they also matter in terms of political strategy that I think the majority of Americans would be offended by what you describe in your book. This is not a majority view that they're offering. Well, I, I think what my position is a very mainstream position. Look, you know, we're all free to practice our faith, in, if any, in our homes and houses of worship and any number of places. Um, but do we really need to be turning our public schools into religious battlefields? Right, and I think this is actually a weak spot for the religious right. Uh, there's a, a speech I give on YouTube, uh, Can Religion Justify Bullying Children? And it discusses in part some of the issues in your book, but also discusses a whole range of other issues where children are harmed not just by religion, but by the use of American law to support religious bias. And I think, unfortunately, most Americans don't know about this yet, and to the degree they become aware of it, they're going to, and I'm including many religious people, will be offended and want to take action. I think we have not been strategic enough and need to become more strategic about exposing uh, this issue and then the many areas in law where children are harmed, because I think it's a, it's a soft underbelly, if you will, of religious extremists. Mm -hmm. So I, I know if you want to add anything in closing, but to me, this is a key book for bringing forward what I think is a real injustice to children but also an injustice to the authority of parents in American society. Thank you.